In the city of Jerusalem, individuals have shared accounts of witnessing a mysterious triangle UFO hovering over the city. This mysterious incident that happened a few years ago has generated a great deal of discussion, conjecture and interest in the field of UFO study and beyond. Analyzing the specifics and ramifications of this encounter offers an intriguing window into the continuous investigation into the nature of unexplained aerial phenomena. Several witnesses first reported sighting the strange triangular-shaped item hovering silently over Jerusalem's Holy Dome of the Rock in 2021. Videos of the incident soon went viral online, generating a lot of attention and scrutiny. One of the most popular shows a bright light falling from the sky, stopping suddenly and hovering above the skyline of an ancient city. It was shot from several different perspectives, and a few moments later, the object leaps skyward and is no longer visible. Witnesses reported the item as huge, triangular, and eerily silent, and these witnesses included tourists, local media, and residents. A weak, pulsating glow was observed coming from the underside of the craft by some, while others claimed to have seen three different lights at each corner of the triangle. Many onlookers were stunned and confused by the object's unexpected appearance and maneuverability, which immediately led to speculative discussions over its origin and intended use. The sighting of the Jerusalem Triangle UFO sparked intense attention in the UFO research community and attracted criticism from both mainstream media and skeptics. Examining the videos that were available, analysts and researchers searched for indications of digital modification or hoaxing. A number of specialists maintained their skepticism and attributed the sighting to common explanations such as drones, aircraft, or optical illusions, while others felt that the material was real due to the consistency of witness accounts and video evidence. An important feature of the occurrence that contributed to the confusion around it was the lack of official government acknowledgement or supporting radar data. The Jerusalem Triangle UFO sighting has been the subject of ongoing dispute and speculation due to the lack of definitive evidence and the covert nature of government agency UFO investigations. The locals' curiosity and conjecture have been aroused by reports of this event. Strangely enough, this is not an isolated incident. Similar mysterious objects have been observed in this exact spot before, leading to conjecture over the unexplained draw that brings these objects here. Some people have expressed concerns about the underlying causes of the strange object's frequent appearances in this area. Some researchers into the unknown who have looked into these cases above Jerusalem have commented that these unidentified objects over Jerusalem provide strong proof of unexplained events happening above the city and have suggested that this is a hotspot for these types of aircrafts. The strange form and behavior of the thing, especially its abrupt disappearance, point to capabilities beyond those of recognized aircraft. In addition, the sighting's location above one of the oldest and most historically significant cities in the world adds to the mystery and raises questions about potential reasons for the presence. On the other hand, detractors and skeptics contend that the videos might be the product of sophisticated hoaxes or CGI modification carried out for publicity or amusement. They highlight discrepancies in the video, such as differences in perspective and lighting, as possible signs of deliberate manipulation. Furthermore, Doubts regarding the veracity of the incident have been heightened by the lack of supporting physical evidence or further eyewitness accounts. In the broader context of UFO phenomena, triangle-shaped UFOs have been reported in various locations worldwide, often described as large, silent craft with lights at each corner. These sightings have been documented over several decades, leading to theories about possible military origins, secret technology prototypes, or more controversially, extraterrestrial visitations. The Jerusalem incident, with its clear visual documentation and multiple witnesses, aligns with these broader patterns of triangular UFO sightings. Although the triangle UFO's eyewitness reports differed, they all had similar elements. Numerous witnesses reported seeing the item with three different lights arranged in a triangle and a dark metallic underbelly that appeared to absorb light from the surrounding area. While some witnesses claimed to be struck with awe and interest, others expressed feelings of fear or foreboding when they saw the UFO. Even while the encounter sparked a lot of attention, efforts to get pictures or videos of the event were mostly fruitless. The only evidence that witnesses had to describe the amazing incident 
was their recollections after the UFO appeared to emanate an odd energy field that interfered with electronic gadgets. The strong memories of individuals who saw the incident nevertheless acted as a reminder of the unsolved mystery surrounding UFOs and their possible consequences for humanity. Following the incident, conjecture on the origin and intended use of the Triangle UFO became widespread. Certain people speculated that it might be a top-secret military aircraft doing tests nearby, while others had more fantastical ideas about alien visitation. The sighting was written off by skeptics as a hoax or a mistaken identification of a conventional aircraft, but for those who were there, it changed their perspective on the world forever. One person said that the thing was probably a black military project aircraft, but as many others pointed out, why would you take a piece of unclassified technology and hover it over a major road where hundreds of people would see it? Many others concurred and noted that this seemed like an odd thing to do, adding that because the military has acres of land on which they could have done this, there was no need to take a chance by revealing technology that hasn't been made public yet. It's interesting to note that one of these triangle-shaped aircrafts has been seen over this area on previous occasions. For a long time, California has been a hotspot for UFO sightings, especially those involving triangle-shaped crafts thanks to its various landscapes and energetic people. California has a long history of UFO sightings that have captivated the interest of both locals and tourists. These sightings can be found anywhere from the sun-kissed beaches of Southern California to the majestic redwoods in the north. Sightings of triangle UFOs stand out among the numerous reports of unexplained aerial phenomena as particularly intriguing, leading to conjecture over their origin and purpose. A number of things contribute to California's attraction as a triangular UFO hotspot, including its vast airspace, important military sites, and lively cultural zeitgeist. Due to the state's closeness to the Pacific Ocean, there are many prospects for UFO sightings. Witnesses frequently claim seeing UFOs close to naval installations and coastal areas. Furthermore, the varied topography of California, which includes both wide-open deserts and heavily forested mountains, creates favorable circumstances for UFO activity by offering plenty of cover for covert operations and aerial maneuvers. The regularity and consistency of triangular UFO sightings in California is one of their most intriguing features. Witness reports of objects with a triangle shape moving through the night sky date back several decades in this state. Similar features mentioned by witnesses include low-altitude flight, silent propulsion, and triangular light formations. These repeating patterns raise questions regarding the origin and purpose of triangular UFOs and point to their intentional and systematic presence in California airspace. The vast metropolis of Los Angeles is the center of UFO activity in Southern California, Many sightings have been reported in the area around the city and its adjacent suburbs. Witnesses have reported seeing triangle-shaped UFOs hovering over distant desert areas like Joshua Tree National Park and famous sites like the Hollywood Sign and Griffith Observatory. The Los Angeles area is known for being a hotspot for triangular UFO sightings because of how many people live there, making it easy for witnesses to notice and record UFO activity. Triangle UFO sightings have also been widely reported in the San Francisco Bay Area, further north. Witnesses have reported seeing them close to Silicon Valley's tech centers and the craggy coastline cliffs of Marin County. Given the area's close proximity to significant military locations like Moffett, Federal Airfield, and Travis Air Force Base, some have conjectured that these sightings may have included classified aircraft or experimental technologies. It is challenging to determine the actual nature of these interactions, though, due to the covert character of military operations in the region. The Triangle UFO sightings in California have drawn the interest of independent researchers as well as government entities, according to eyewitness reports from civilians. Due to the state's long history of military action and aerospace innovation, some analysts theorize that triangular UFOs could be connected to advanced aircraft prototypes or classified military projects. The mystery surrounding these encounters, however, is only increased by the government's lack of official acknowledgement or disclosure, which encourages conjecture and theories among UFO enthusiasts. A huge triangle-shaped object was seen flying above the state of California in 1997, which is one of the most well-known triangle UFO events in California history. Thousands of witnesses reported seeing the object, 
Californians are alert and keep a close eye on the night sky in the hopes of catching proof of this elusive aerial phenomenon, even if the state is still a hotspot for triangle UFO sightings. It is conjecture to determine whether these sightings are the product of superior technology, secret military experiments, or extraterrestrial visitation. One thing is for sure, though. UFO enthusiasts all across the world are still enthralled with California's attraction as a triangle UFO hotspot. The Mysterious Belgian UFO Wave During November 1989 and April 1991, Belgium saw a surge in UFO sightings that stands as one of the most amazing periods in UFO history. Furthermore, more than 2,000 event reports would be generated by the sightings, and the majority of these are inherently highly detailed. Additionally, more than 650 of these accounts were the focus of an inquiry, and 500 of these reports were never explained. The Belgian UFO wave is all about credible reports of unidentified object sightings. In fact, the authorities would be the ones to advocate for such extensive inquiries, and the Belgian government made it quite evident that, even in the face of extremely illogical and odd occurrences, the people of a nation would and did respond with composure and reason. On November 29, 1989, just after 5 in the evening, patrolling police in the town of Eupen would alert their switchboard operator, Albert Kreutz, to the presence of a massive aerial object hovering over a field in front of them. The witnesses who observed the mysterious object described it as being so bright it was lighting up the pitch like a football stadium. Given that Christmas was almost here, Kreutz joked, saying that it could have been Santa. However, the officers on duty advised him to climb to the top level and peer out the window to see it for himself. He followed advice after realizing the story was not a practical joke from his co-workers, and when he arrived, the enormous unidentified object was visible. Calls about the weird light object were flooding the switchboard by the time Kreutz returned to his position. Dieter Plumens, a police officer and his partner reported seeing the object, and Kreutz instructed them to pursue it. It hovered over a retirement home for a few minutes before coming to a standstill. They too came to a stop and observed the strange spectacle taking place in front of them, and described that the object had three orange and brown lights in each corner, forming a clear triangle. A bright red light, which flashed at regular intervals, was located in the center of the underbelly, and they said that a small drone-like object emerged from the larger craft and began to flash in unison with the central light overhead while Plumans and his companion watched. After surveying the surroundings, it quickly reconnected with the triangle and headed out. That evening, police officers alone would report 13 sightings, and more than 60 of them would be citizens. The sightings garnered international notice by early December and were no longer just a domestic story. They all spoke about the same thing, a triangle with three orange lights and a red light in the center. By the evening of December 11th, and into December 12th, there had been yet another spike in sightings. During the skies over Ernage, one of these sightings occurred. Andre Amond, a veteran army colonel, was the witness. Amond and his wife would see three brilliant lights arranged in the shape of a triangle, with a pulsating red light in the middle, as they drove to the train station to pick up their son. Amond would stop his automobile so he could have a better look. The triangular spaceship also slowed as he did. He did this multiple times, the craft slowing down with him each time, and it then entered a nearby forest. Amond pursued it and eventually stopped his vehicle close to a wide open space, and the luminous flying object emerged from behind the trees. Amond would claim that there was absolutely no sound coming from this massive object, but he could hear other traffic and even a nearby train. The craft sped off just as he was ready to leave. Later, Amond would say that no man-made object can do what he had just witnessed. The public would begin to report more sightings, and many people in Liège and Namur would tell of sighting a triangle-shaped craft hovering over their homes, with a man from jupil sur meuse reported seeing a bright object over the neighbouring woodland, which he said was struggling to free itself from a spruce tree. He was so near that he could make out electron symbols on its side. When the waves started, the Belgian Society for the Study of Space Phenomena was already the biggest UFO organization in the country. But as more and more public accounts poured in, they nearly took front stage in the inquiry of the wave as a whole. For instance, following their interviews with the witnesses, they would frequently address the local and national press 
with extracts from their statements appearing in a number of periodicals. They served as the spokesperson for the Belgian wave in this fashion, at least while the activities were taking place, but as the number of reports rose, so did the need for their assistance. So much so that the organization began hiring an increasing number of investigators. This, at least theoretically and frequently cited by skeptics, may have somewhat lowered the investigators' overall competency and accuracy. The group may have assembled one of the most thorough and recorded accounts of a UFO wave, and while some could charge the organization with controlling the issue, those documents might end up being quite helpful. The sightings would persist in the skies over Belgium. The public was informed about official reporting processes by December 21st, and they would notify the authorities of the sighting. The radar station would be contacted as soon as the police had confirmed it, one that might send out F-16 fighter fighters on standby to intercept. Although it wasn't immediately known, the fighter jets had been launched on March 30, 1990. According to information disclosed at a NATO press conference in July 1990, the significant number of reporters would hear Major General Wilfred de Brouwer's remarks via the tapes of an F-16 flying. The triangular craft reached a speed of more than a thousand knots at one point, and in addition, it demonstrated the ability to increase speed from 100 to 500 knots in a short period of time. In the end, the craft disappeared at an incredible speed, and it could be worthwhile at this time to take a closer look at the jet chase. The aforementioned occurrence started on March 30th at 11 in the evening. Mr. Renkin, a gendarmerie master sergeant, would telephone the control reporting center from his residence. It would be his contention that he saw three odd lights traveling towards Thorembay Jean Bleu. He would state that it was evident the lights were attached to a triangle object's underside. Furthermore, they were unquestionably neither planets nor stars. He would also say that the lights, which included red, green, and yellow lights, were changing colors. To see the object for themselves, a patrol unit from the control reporting center would be sent to Renkin's land. By 11.10, Renkin reported that the first set of lights had been joined by another set of three lights arranged in a triangle. The control reporting center reported an unidentified object on their systems at the same time. Just before 11.30, the patrol squad would reach the Renkin property and they verified the unusual lights promptly. Captain Pinson was among those present. Even though the prevailing color is red, he noted in his report back to the control reporting center that the color changes often. The lights appeared to follow no specific sequence or pattern, yet they would alternate between blue, white, yellow, and green. The control reporting center kept an eye on the odd anomaly on their radar systems as Renkin and the patrol unit kept observing the lights. Just before midnight, the traffic control center reported seeing another confirmed radar detection. The order to send military fighters on an intercept operation was delivered at 11.56. Over the course of the first seven minutes on March 31st, the F-16 attempted nine interceptions in all. But on the three occasions they were able to lock onto their targets, they would just vanish at the previously noted lightning-fast speed. The witnesses on the ground saw as this happened, and they could still make out the triangular lights, and sometimes they could even make out the F-16s circling the area where the UFOs were hovering. From their vantage point, they saw the larger, brighter triangle rise quickly, hiding some of the lights but leaving the brightest visible, while the smaller set of lights vanished as the jets neared. The jets kept trying to lock on and intercept the unusual plane for the next 40 minutes or so, but all of them would fall short. The craft had entirely disappeared from the radar screen by one in the morning. Five minutes later, though, there was another sighting reported from the ground in a different area of the city. Pinson would keep tracking the lights from below, and some of the information he would provide is fascinating. Especially, as we will discuss later, when the legitimacy of the Petit Rechin photo is investigated. He would say that the light with the greatest brightness seemed to move in quick, jerky movements. Many arguments were put up in response to the claim that there was noticeable distortion surrounding the lights in the image above. There were no further reports of the unusual object that evening, and by 1.30 in the evening it seemed to have vanished permanently. That night, Yves Mielberg's was one of the pilots. It seemed possible that Mielberg's tape was exhibiting a magnetic fault because the other F-16 cassettes were also malfunctioning. Years later, Mielbergs would say that he firmly believed there was something in the sky that night. He would go on to cite witnesses on the ground, 
the control tower's own radar system, and his own confirmation tapes. The reports of sightings would keep coming in thick and fast until late spring of 1991. Then they would stop as fast as they started, but before they could, a gullible bystander would take what may turn out to be the most significant UFO photo ever. Because of the simultaneous observations of ground witnesses and radar, the jet chase on March 30th and 31st is arguably one of the most fascinating and convincing incidents of the Belgian wave. The fact that the eyewitnesses on the ground were unable to take photos or even record video of the incidents may have been unfortunate. However, the incident happened very quickly, which put them in a difficult situation when it came to reporting what they saw. Nonetheless, it may or may not add a bit more credence to the witnesses' account that they were gendarmes. The incident's comparatively high altitude at which the sighting took place sets it apart from many previous Belgian wave events. Moreover, the very high speeds on exhibit seem to rule out the possibility that the triangular plane was just a mistakenly identified conventional aircraft. This also enables us to rule out the possibility that the lights were celestial bodies. An additional fascinating finding made by researchers concerning the remarkable velocities recorded was the conspicuous absence of sound at velocities that would have undoubtedly breached the sound barrier. Coincidentally, this component of the jet chase has never been addressed, despite numerous hypotheses offered by dubious quarters to account for the sightings. The fact that just one radar ping was detected for the whole triangle of lights may also be intriguing, as it implies that the lights were actually a single, solid object. Skeptics also frequently ignore this other component of the incident. In essence, one of the most significant elements of the wave as a whole seems to have been the aircraft chase in late March, and one that merits more research. Despite the tremendous attention and seeming veracity around the Petit Rechin shot, many have deemed it to be a complete fabrication. And when a hitherto unidentified guy named Patrick M came forward to acknowledge the photo, it seemed that these charges were true. He would later be identified as Patrick Marischal, who publicly explained to the media how he created the photograph. He even showed previously unreleased images of the tests he conducted to get the ideal shot. Before Patrick Marischal's entrance, there were inquiries from many quarters. For instance, it was noted that there were grounds for suspicion given the four-month delay in submitting the photo for public review. On the other hand, someone would have stepped up sooner rather than later if they had intended to deceive the public. Further doubts about the image's veracity are raised by critics who claim that the background of the picture isn't real. Even while it seems doubtful, it's possible that this was a staged admission made to deflect attention from the case while also making it simpler to write off subsequent sightings that are similar as being fabricated or misidentified. Perhaps we ought to keep these ideas in the back of our minds. As one might expect, several theories have been proposed to account for the recent spike of sightings throughout Belgium. Though many sightings, it seems, might just as well be attributed to misidentified aeroplanes or even celestial objects, the skeptical perspective seems to center on the idea of simple mass delusion or panic. According to some opinions, the UFO investigative team that carried out the real-time investigations during the sightings overstated the reports and, in Mark Hallett's opinion, disseminated false information. Hallett concludes that the Belgian wave was nothing more than a widespread hallucination that was fed by this seeming dissemination of false information. Similar opinions were expressed by Philip Klaas, who asserted that the public's perception of UFO sightings and reports was just the result of Belgian media persuading people that UFOs may be in the vicinity. The multi-pilot Canadian UFO sighting Because of their extensive flying experience and the potential damage to their reputations from disclosing such sightings, professional airline pilots' reports of UFO sightings are frequently considered very trustworthy. Not only did one airline pilot see something unusual above the skies of Canada in the early hours of January 2024, but numerous did as well. Furthermore, the audio recording of the conversations between the pilots and the control tower is available for public listening. There is still disagreement on exactly what was seen in those wee hours. Despite many justifications being offered, the overwhelming majority of persons who witnessed those bizarre occurrences are adamant that what they observed was not a typical aircraft nor a naturally occurring phenomenon. Reports from the Transport Canada database 
state that beginning at approximately 4.20 in the morning on January 19, 2024, a number of pilots in various aircraft reported seeing unusual lights in the Canadian prairie's skies. Additionally, the conversation between the pilots and air traffic control was captured on camera and made available to the general public. When the pilot of the Morningstar 7060 asked if there were any active military in the airspace just north of Winnipeg, they were told there weren't any that they were aware of at the start of the clip. The pilot continued by describing lots of active bright lights in formation. At a height of roughly 50,000 feet, there were three of them in total. The pilot reported seeing three or four really bright lights, and then they kind of form like a triangle formation, and then they disappear, and then they come back. This was in response to the control tower's request for confirmation of what he had seen. The recording makes it quite evident that the air traffic controller is really confused by the information the pilot is providing him, and things would only become stranger later that morning. Air traffic control started contacting other planes after this initial discussion to find out if they had also noticed flashing lights. A little over 10 minutes later, Air Canada 7086, another aircraft, reported seeing an aircraft with odd flashing lights right in front of them. Additionally, it was said that these lights were forming triangles, then flying away and coming back. Air traffic control at this point verified that this was the second observation of the identical aerial show. It was obvious that morning that there was something odd in the skies. Shortly after, some sort of flashing lights somewhere over the prairies, perhaps in a triangle shape, prompted a request for information from Cargo Jet 591. A crew member on Air Canada 328 provided a possible explanation, stating that they had also observed the lights and wondered if they matched the heading of the position of the sun or if they were just like a reflection from the sun. They spent about an hour watching the lights, he added, and saw that they seemed to move up as they moved east, which led him to wonder if they were sun reflections. The pilot clarified, though, that this was only a wild guess and that the light show looks quite spectacular and weird, whatever it was. The crew of Air Canada 786 received a suggestion from the pilot of Air Canada 328 through the control tower. Although he was certainly no expert, the pilot disagreed with the assessment, saying that it doesn't really seem like they're in any type of orbit and that they're moving side to side and then going away from each other and then forming triangles. The control tower can be heard in the recording asking Flare 600 if they were still seeing the unusual lights that they had previously reported. They said they were in response, adding it's very strange. About six of them are flying at a high height in random formation. It's also noteworthy to note that during these interactions, one of the pilots asks the control tower what protocol they have in place for reporting sightings. The operator responds that the shift manager will receive them and choose whether or not to file any additional reports. The pilot inquires as to whether the control tower will report the sightings as a UFO, to which they reply that the shift manager will be presented with the precise report submitted by the relevant pilots before they take any additional action. This illustrates how simple it would be to consider UFO sightings to be lost in the sea of knowledge about contemporary aircraft, as it may already be. The airborne anomalies that January morning were recorded by at least four different aircraft between 4.20 and 6 in the morning. Whatever the lights were, they were higher than their aircraft, according to all of them. One pilot estimated that they were at a height of about 100,000 feet. The lights were estimated to be between 80 and 90 miles away, and they appeared to be going east based on the positions of several of the planes that made reports in the sky. The admission made by two other aircrew members that night, while they had not observed anything unusual that specific night, that they had been seeing those lights for probably the last 18 months or so, was also noteworthy. The pilot added that the lights' movements were consistent with what they had previously observed, describing them as sometimes making a triangle, sometimes making a diamond and square, and adding that they were always eastbound and always at the 11 or 12 position. It's interesting to note that another pilot claimed to have seen the light before, but only in the west, which may indicate it wasn't a natural phenomenon. In the end, that morning's events left everyone involved feeling a mixture of fascinated and confused. On a Morningstar Air Express freight flight from Calgary to Toronto, the pilot stated that the objects they had observed were unlike anything I've ever seen in the 15 years of night flying and that they were definitely not satellites. According to a second witness, an air traffic controller, 
They said that there was no active airspace, military airspace or anything like that we're aware of, further saying that they honestly had no idea what that might be. In the middle of the incidents, there is a shift change in the control tower and the new operator is assigned by her shift manager to complete a form detailing the sightings. She starts asking the pilots the questions, and it's interesting to hear their answers. A brief description of the sighting, number, size, shape, is the first question posed by the operator. After replying that multiple different points of light would be the way we would describe this, one of the pilots goes on to say that there's no specific numbers, adding that sometimes there were three, sometimes there were six, and sometimes there were just some individual lights just flying at random intervals. The pilot estimated that the lights were between 70,000 and 100,000 feet above the ground. The same pilot said that the movement was so random and all over the place in reaction to the direction of movement of the object. On occasion, they saw three lights in a triangle formation just flying randomly up and down, left, right, all over the place, and the pilot reported that as far as they could see, they were moving at a very fast pace and in all directions. Pilots reported seeing extremely similar lights just under two and a half hours later, at about 8.20 in the morning, about north of Birmingham, Alabama, in the United States. Thanks to the Memphis Air Traffic Control radio channel, the pilot's conversation was made available to the public. One of the pilots asks whether anyone else can see the unusual lights that appear to be to the west of the jet at the beginning of the audio. These lights were really high, in formation, and really bright. The pilot replies that there are multiple lights and that they are coming from the west when the controller asks where the lights are. The pilot said they didn't think so since Starlink doesn't flash in response to the suggestion that they might be seeing Starlink satellites. It is debatable whether or not these lights were the same as those seen above Canada a few hours prior. Still, that would seem highly likely. And if that's the case, it seems that in the early hours of January 19, 2024, something quite bizarre and unusual was making its way over the continent of North America. The audio feed provides a fascinating insight into the witnesses' demeanor during the encounter, in addition to their understanding of aviation. This makes the Canadian Prairies incident noteworthy, even though the witnesses are all well-trained pilots with extensive aviation experience. It is undeniable that several experienced pilots saw something unusual that evening. This may be especially true given that at least two other pilots claimed to have observed the same light formations on earlier occasions, even though they were not present when the weird lights appeared on that specific night, and not just once, but multiple times. In addition, we are aware that Canada, like many other parts of North America, has a long history of UFO reports. Therefore, it shouldn't come as a surprise that pilots may frequently observe these odd airborne abnormalities. We might be curious about the number of further sightings that have not been reported to the media or to anyone at all. As of today, these UFO mysteries remain unsolved. Many UFO sightings go unreported due to fear of ridicule or disbelief. Therefore, the number of reported sightings may not accurately reflect the total number of incidents. Despite these challenges, organizations and various government agencies around the world track and compile data on reported UFO sightings. For instance, many of these websites alone receives thousands of reports annually from individuals claiming to have witnessed unidentified aerial phenomena.